بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين أما بعد الحمد لله All praise is due to Allah whose rewards are everlasting All praise to Allah who guides to the truth and has legislated fasting and upon his messenger we ask his salah and his praise and we ask to remain steadfast until the end of our days Our topic is our eating habits during the month of Ramadan and the first thing is that if you ask people what are the benefits of fasting or if you ask them what is fasting about the first response you'll get is during fasting there is no eating and no drinking from sunup until sundown and it's the first thing that you hear from people and a lot of times that's where it ends that no eating, no drinking, sun up to sundown. And few people mention other points about fasting. Now, we all know the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may attain taqwa. So the question is, how do you get taqwa, this piety and God consciousness, and being aware of the fact that Allah is watching you in the fear of Allah, just by not eating and not drinking, and you get taqwa. How does that happen? And we see, we see many other many other benefits. The Prophet ﷺ said, As-siyamu junna, that, that psalm, fasting is a shield from the hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, Man saama Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbih. Whoever fasts Ramadan, like with with faith or a firm belief and seeking the reward, he will have his previous sins forgiven. So how does all this great benefit come from just staying away from eating and drinking? What happens if someone during the day in Ramadan genuinely forgets and they drink and they eat? What happens? What's the ruling here? They can keep fasting because it's a gift from Allah Azza wa so they forget during the day in Ramadan, they eat and they drink, and then suddenly, they remember, one of our imams was invited to an all-you-can-eat, and he forgot he was fasting, so he was absolutely full, and then he remembered that he was fasting. So you can absolutely, you can eat and drink by mistake, and your fasting is still valid. That means there's something else that happens also besides just abstaining from eating and drinking. We see... A hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that كل عمل ابن آدم يضاعف الحسنة بعشر أمثالها إلى سبعمائة ضعفا So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that every good deed of the son of Adam is multiplied in reward from 10 to 700 times except for fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إلا الصوم فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به That except for fasting for it is for me and I will grant the reward for it. Then Allah describes, He leaves, meaning the servant, his passion and his food for my sake. So that means we put the food and the drink aside for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so that we can also free ourselves to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, most people, as we said, most people just worry about what goes inside their mouth and they're not worried about what comes out of their mouth. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلْ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَدْعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ That whoever does not abstain from this deceitful speech, like from lying and these actions, Allah is not in need of him leaving his food and his drink. And we mentioned this hadith in, in the khutbah. So people then, they worry about what goes into their mouth. Like someone will worry, after wudu, they'll spit a hundred times, to make sure that not a droplet of water goes into their throat. But then they don't mind backbiting and lying and saying things that are haram all while they're fasting, but they spit a million times to make sure not a drop of water, not a droplet of water. And as a note here, the scholar said that that is not, is not necessary to do that, to make sure that there's nothing absolutely left in your mouth. So, the point is then, we put the food and the drink aside so we, for the sake of Allah, and then we free up ourselves to think, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But un, unfortunately what happens is that we put our food and our drink aside, and then we spend our time and our effort in preparing for the time to eat. 
I call it the countdown to iftar. So we wake up, oh, 10 hours to iftar. After oh, only 5 hours to iftar. Oh, half an hour, I'm going to destroy and ravish the food. Countdown. The whole point was, we leave the food aside so we can focus on worship. But we leave the food aside and we focus on, okay, what else can I include with the meal today? What can we do for the food? So, maybe then, the problem is eating and how we regard eating. Because, as you've all heard, that many people, now, they live to eat and they do not eat to live. If people eat to live, that means they have other concerns in their life and they just do this act of eating just so they can remain alive and can sustain themselves. While other people, they and this is the majority of people unfortunately, they live to eat. And they live to try different kinds of gourmet. Oh yes, I've tried Chinese food, I've tried Thai food, have you tried Pakistani food? Let's try this kind of, kind of food. Let's go to this exotic restaurant today. People just live to experience these different types of food. And the problem is the way we eat. So we eat to celebrate. If we want to celebrate, there has to be food. Well, everyone has food in their home, and they're not hungry, and they're not starving, but we have to eat if there's a celebration. To socialize, we eat. We want to get to know someone, why don't we have dinner sometime? Okay. And if there's a prize, we give someone a coupon or a ticket to go to some kind of restaurant and eat again, because we're rewarding him, even though the, that person's fridge is full of food. And we eat to honor people. So I want to honor someone, I bring them to my house, and I make lots and lots of food for that person. So as the poet said, to be respected by people, and praised and not damned, offer a roasted camel stuffed with two lambs. And to be considered generous and not poverty stricken, make sure the two lambs are stuffed with chicken. And to be further respected and even loved if you wish, make sure that the chicken is stuffed with fish. And to make it a great experience and make everything nice, surround the whole mixture with mounds of rice. This is generally how we regard the issue. But let's look at how we're supposed to be eating. The Prophet ﷺ, how many, first of all, how many of us have heard of the hadith of filling a third with food and a third with water and a third with, with air? We've, we've all heard. How many people can quote the beginning of the hadith? You know, because this part, this is the extreme. This is, if there's no other way, this is the maximum that we can do. But we quote this hadith as if this is the minimum. That you fill with a third with food and a third with... Or perhaps we fill a third with food and a third with dessert. And then a third with water and whatever we can fill with grapes. Whatever can fill the gap after that. The beginning of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا مَلَأَ أَبْنُ آدَمْ وَعَاءً شَرًّا مِّن بَطْنِهِ that the son of Adam has not ever filled a vessel worse than his stomach. So the worst thing you can fill to the max is your stomach. This is the beginning of the hadith. Then it continues. بحسب ابن آدم لقيمات يقمن صلبه So sufficient for the son of Adam are a few bites to sustain him. A few bites to sustain the person, this is sufficient. And then the Prophet ﷺ says فَإِن كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ so if there is no other way and you have to, فَثُلُثٌ لِطَعَامِ وَثُلُثٌ لِشَرَابِ وَثُلُثٌ لِنَفْسِ If there is no way and you have to, then a third for your food, then a third for your drink, and a third for your air, or so you can breathe. So this is how it's supposed to be. This is the maximum that you're allowed. If there is no other way and you have to do it, then you fill a third. But the way we look at it, it's the minimum. The minimum is, mashallah, the brother, mashallah, he follows the hadith, he fills only a third of his stomach. But no, this is the maximum that you're allowed. So now the minimum, of course, is the maximum. And the maximum is when we're an inch away from exploding. And, and that's how يعني, it has become. And most people can't stop if they're not full to the brim. And you find them dissatisfied and their faces are sour. I didn't get full all the way. I still have this much left. You know? And they're looking frantically, searching for something to stuff that little gap so they have no way to breathe after that. So because of this, it's important for us to see the relationship between eating and worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll be surprised that you find a link between eating and patience and obedience and worship and memory and knowledge and iman. One of the wise men that I met, he was telling me that one of the ways he finds if people, he recognizes if someone is patient or impatient, he says when people sit to dine or to eat, and then they're waiting for other people to show up. 
He says, I know the person who is impatient because he can't wait for everyone to show up. So he starts to break a little bit off a piece of bread. Then he starts to find some kind of sauce he can dip that bread in and put it in their mouth. Or maybe grab a few raisins from the, the mountain of rice because they, can't, they don't have this patience. So they start nibbling before people show up. And this is one of the things in fasting, we learn this kind of patience. And we're going to get into that inshallah. And it teaches us also the fasting. When we don't eat during the days and we're fasting, it teaches us obedience of Allah. And we'll get into how it facilitates worship. The early Muslims used to say, Al-Bitna, that which goes into the stomach, Al-Bitna, Tudhibul Fitna. 